Hello, Trampoline friends. Welcome to Trampoline Insight. I'm Nuno Marino alongside Stephen Gluckstein, and today we have episode 20. That is right. We are on episode 20. Wow. Today we'll be talking a little bit about routine composition. That's right. We're going to discuss how we build routines and tips we have for progressing from one routine to the next. We'll dive into some strategy about what routine is right and when for the athlete. But before we dive into routine building, Nuno, what's your philosophy as to when an athlete should be progressing uh, to the next routine and increasing their difficulty? Should they always be competing their hardest routine? So that, that's an interesting point, Steven. Uh, I usually don't have them competing the hardest routine, okay? But, but I, I, can see, I can see when they get to the top of their game, sometimes trying their hardest routine because, you know, that there is no more to go. But on, let's say as a, as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, I enjoy having the athlete competing a stable routine and be working on two routines after already. Okay, that's my rule of thumb. And then after that, they, as they go older and higher in level, that, that gap starts getting closer and closer and closer. And this is just an example for, for an athlete that is level eight, right? They can be easily working on level nine already and some skills of level 10 and start building those skills already and get that progression faster in the future. And then when they go level nine, they're already working on, on, on elite uh, skills, right? But for a senior elite, and especially with the new code of points that is coming, that I think it's quite interesting, right? They can easily have a, a stable routine that they can do in qualification, but have a harder routine that they're working on that they can use in case they make a final that they were not expecting. And if they're not expecting, why not go all in, right? Or mm -hmm. so it, why not do a 17-1 routine, even if it's the hardest routine that they ever tried, but they have been doing it for, for fairly consistent in, in, in training, right? And, and at that point, they really, that really is the hardest routine they have. So I think in the beginning, for sure not. There should be other steps after that. But later in life, I think it, that, that gap starts to close a lot. Very, very close. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we're going to see here as we progress through these routines is as they get higher into the uh, later elite levels, right, from youth elite all the way to senior elite, that the philosophies will start to change a little bit, right? One's more developmental and the other's, um, you know, more building confidence, um, experimenting with different strategies. Um, and uh, I don't know if we're going to get to the senior elite stuff today because, I mean, it's a, it's a long spectrum, right, from level eight all the way up there. But we'll, we'll touch up on a little bit. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I think um, one of the things we're going to discuss is the Tarzan method and that you don't, you don't let go. So Tarzan swings from vine to vine, right? And you don't mm -hmm. let go of the last vine until you have a really good grasp on the next one. And, um, and some people just kind of like swing and then they take that jump to the jump. next vine. And I hope I get the next one, right? And it's kind of like, well, the, we've done the pieces and let's, you know, let's, let's compete this routine. And then they wonder, you know, why, why they're not, you know, making a competition. Um, which leads me to my next question. If an athlete is falling a lot, is it ever the fault of the routine? Uh, I, I, well, it can be the fault of, of a skill if the technique is not, it's not really done, right? But it, uh, by my experience, when the athletes get to the highest level and they're falling a lot, it's usually not the problem of the routine. It's either their mental preparation or even the routine is too much for them at that time. Mm -hmm. It can be several, several things, obviously, but it's not the problem of the routine. It's just they're not ready to give that step just yet, most of the time. Right. So I, I, I don't mean like the routine composition, like how the routine's laid out, mm -hmm. but is it, is it too difficult of a routine for them? Exactly. Right? exactly. Is, That's is, what I mean. Is that, uh, is, is that a, the fault of, of the athlete or, or should the, you know, the coach say, you know what, let's really look at this difficulty. Maybe we should take a step back. And, and, and I, I truly believe the coaches should, should do that and they should have the, the ability to do that and communicate with their athletes about it. And I think in, in, a, in a healthy in a healthy coach-athlete relationship, that's exactly what happens. You know, the coach goes to the athlete. They, let's say, let's say we're already at that level because if in a healthy relationship, we shouldn't even get to that level. In my point, but but it can happen. 
it can happen, right? And sometimes the athletes are so excited and they're like, I really think I can do this. Like, can I try this routine? I really want to do this routine. And the coach is like, oh, I'm not so sure, but maybe, maybe, maybe it's ready. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of moments of doubt in, in that stage, right? But in a healthy relationship, the coach should be able to say, hey, hey okay, you know what? Why don't we why don't we step back a little bit and why don't we do the, the the older routine here and then we'll give two steps forward after that and you know I I applied that in my own in my own um, strategy when I was competing I had I always had a lot of trouble with the half trip and I competed the half trip I would say fairly young right by by 22 23 I was competing the half trip although by these to, by today's standards is not very no. young okay? yeah but at that time i thought it was it was pretty young but then it became a very unstable skill so when i was 31 i think i went back a little bit to to drift half half trip again right mm -hmm. so and, and and i made world cup finals with that routine at that time in bulgaria for example in varna i made world cup finals and i was fourth place with with, with a routine with only two trips because that was the approach that we need to have at that time there was some things technically that were not flowing very well and we just had to simply make that change and then did after that i went back to do the half trips again mm -hmm. did you think that it was did you well did you change it because of um uh instability like because you were you were falling or did you change it because you thought you would score higher with the other routine uh i changed because of instability and then whenever I did the routine for the first time, I'm like, Ooh, okay, wait, wait, wait. Maybe I don't really score that much lower with this routine either. So if, if it's good, if it's in the middle and if it's high, maybe I don't really score mm -hmm. that much lower. And when I, when I made finals in that, in that, in that uh, World Cup, I was like, hmm, okay. So I actually competed that routine for a couple more competitions, maybe almost half the year on that routine. I only switched later because it was really much more stable and, and it was really helping me at that time. So, yeah. And I think, and I think that's kind of like what we talked about, we started to talk about or hint at earlier is like, once you get into the higher levels, you, it's not necessarily philosophy as it is strategy, you know, Correct. and it also depends on the competition, right? So I know I was competing um, a 17 one uh, consistently. And then when I went to the Pan American games, right, the depth, well, first of all, I think there was only 10 competitors, right? And the depth mm -hmm. of the competition wasn't that big. So I said, you know what? I really need to stand my feet. It's not worth it to risk to make a 17-1 to make a little mistake. So we went back to a 16-5 or 16-6, right? And it was 100% consistent, right? So, yep. and, and, and we set new goals. And, it, and it, just because you, it, especially now with how many components are in your total score, Right, you can say, you know what? Let's take a step back and difficulty. Let's really try to hit 18 seconds on your time of flight, 19 or you know, 17.5, whatever it may be. You know, there's there's other ways you know to go about it. Um, let's start from the beginning, though. Okay, let's go. Exactly, let's, let's, we're we're already getting excited. We're, we're, <laughs> we're enjoying this conversation way too much. Yeah, let's start from the um, beginning. All right, so so one more question. And, and then we'll get into this routine building. Do when you're building from the from the bottom up, is it strictly off difficulty? Do you just go okay six five? Next routine we have to do is six seven or six nine. Is that is that how you normally build? No, no. Uh, for me, it, it, it's all about the athletes and their capabilities and the skills that they have. Right? Everyone is different. Okay. Some athletes are able to do, to do a half out at nine years old, at ten years old. Other people are not able to do a half out at ten years old. They get they only when they're thirteen or fourteen. Right? So I usually have a set of a set of routines that they follow from level to level. And we'll talk about it later. There is a little. There is some gaps there depending on their uh, individual capabilities right but usually i go from routine to routine and whenever they're ready to go to the next step they do the next routine whenever they have the skills but it's not based on difficulty it's based on the skills that they can do at that time simple simple as yeah. that in, in my opinion now can some do earlier and, and get ahead faster yes maybe and others cannot we're all different we all started walking at different stages right no one and now we all walk it's right so it's as simple as that people enjoy comparing themselves with other athletes oh my goodness that athlete is doing a half up she's only eight wow she's gonna be amazing well did she start walking when she was two months right and uh, and the, the other athlete only started walking at one year old do they not both walk right now 
they do, right? So it only depends whenever you achieve the skills, how much you work to put those skills together. It's as simple as that. And how much you work to, to achieve those skills. It, I only did, yeah. people won't believe this, but I did my first half out when I was 14 or 15 years old. People were like, yeah. what? I, was, I couldn't even do fools and rudies very well. Seriously. It's, and then in two, in two years, my development was, was so big that in 16 years old, I went to WAGS. I was doing a, a, a five double routine, I think. Half out, half out, half out, double, Brandy Fuller. The double A. Half yeah. out back in the end. Okay. Or double, I never did double A. I did a double, another double A at the end, something like that. I don't even remember very well. Right? And then at 17 or 18, I was doing a, a one trip routine at the Youth Europeans. So right. it, it, it's, it really, whenever you go to that teenage period and how much you develop, that's what matters over there. And that's think, how, much, uh, how much you push for it. Yeah, and, and, and just to, to comment on, I, I agree 100% that I, I don't build routines off difficulty. Sometimes the next routine is even a lower difficulty, right? It's based mm -hmm. off of skills yeah, and sometimes development, it is. development of skills. Um, and I had an, uh, it's kind of, and I just had this thought that I had never had before. <clears throat> when we're teaching children, right, in, in school, we want to teach them the alphabet. We want to teach them a second language because they're like sponges, right? But mm -hmm. it's funny that's it's the opposite case in trampoline, right? They don't. They might re remember some stuff and make some good habits of straight legs and pointed toes. But as far as skills go, they become sponges and understand better after they've already matured, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think it's kind of counterintuitive to how we teach in the world, right? We try to teach from yeah. preschool and kindergarten. And it's, so it's, it's tough, I think, for coaches to be like, we need to get them early. We need to teach them early, you know, because that's something that we've never done uh, before. So before I, we I, jump I in, I can go tell ahead. you, wait, wait, before, before this is a really good topic, but I can tell you the, the biggest reason I have sometimes in pushing a kid and doing some things a little bit before is because I, I hand spot everything. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to spot younger ones, right? Or, 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 or mm -hmm. how do you say, uh, less tall kids or shorter kids to do things than, mm -hmm. than whenever they grow. And then, then it's going to be much harder to spot, especially, especially the first double, the first double tuck and the first half out. I think they're the biggest problem there because after that, every, every, after that, everything is a puzzle. So after that, they understand everything is a puzzle, but those first skills, if they're really big and they have to spot them the first time, that can be quite, quite, quite compelling for me. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and for any coach. So I think that that's probably the biggest reason why I really enjoy having double tucks and half outs quite early if they're able to do it. Not everyone is. Right. Okay. Not everyone is, but if they are, and then after that, it becomes a little bit more, more easier process. I think. For sure. I think learning that first double, being able to hold on for two and understand yep. the timing yep. of two is, you know, that first one yeah, is, is huge. Because after that, you're still doing the same timing. You're starting to add twists and, you know, positions. And, and after that, it's a puzzle. You know, you go from back, half turn to feet all the time in all the skills. If you do the progressions like we do, right? After, it, it's just a puzzle. You just add half turn here, add half turn there. You add, 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 but the timing is almost all the same. The landing is almost all the same. So we, you, the first ones are the, the, the hardest ones. I'm not going to deny. The first ones are the hardest. The first double, every time I have to spot a first double, my heart goes... Yep. Yeah. Right. The first half out. The first one in three. The first one in three. Ooh, if I had a pit, go. that would be the, that would be the best way with, with a pit. But we don't have a pit, so we don't. Yeah. So we have to do everything hand spotting. Um, All right. So one, one more, one more last philosophical, okay, philosophical more questions. questions because it, um, I, I see a lot. Of, I, I feel like there's a lot of coaches in the, in, at least in the United States, that would benefit from this question. How long do you leave an athlete doing a routine for? Should they just compete the routine through the whole season? Should be they be changing? Okay, so that's a tough question. I'm not going to mm -hmm. deny because that, that depends on so many things. It depends how old that athlete is. Is that athlete on the path of the development that we think it's correct or is it late or is it ahead, mm -hmm. right? If it's ahead, I try not – I can leave them for a whole season. I, I don't see a sometimes problem, right? More. If it's, sometimes more. If it's behind – 
sometimes I need them to do a jump for another routine a little bit earlier just to kind of catch up and be competitive because all this is a mental game as well, right? They need to feel motivated and feel competitive to continue in the sport. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of components that right. go into this, right? Let's say they are on the right path, right? If they are on the right path, they usually stay for one season. Usually, that really depends. Okay, on the level, if they're level eight, they stay for the whole season. Most, most likely, right. or if I, or if they're ready to mobilize, sometimes they do level at the beginning of the year, mobilize level nine, and do do yeah. the rest of the year as level nine. Right? It, it really depends on the stage where the athlete starts. <laughs> where the athlete starts mm-hmm. this conversation, that's 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 the, the, the strategy. But I don't, I, I, I made a, a um. I feel like I had a problem with my career, okay? So I, I, I always worship Moskalenko, right? Moskalenko was our, my icon and like it was the icon for many people, right? So the routine he did was my goal. Trip. After, and I trip. never, straight. yes, <laughs> right? And, and, and whenever I achieved that routine, I did that routine for 10 years, right? Mm-hmm. I never saw myself going over. And I thought I, now I look back and looking at what these guys do now, I'm like, I could, probably do, be doing that too if I had an open mind about things if I had an open mind about when I saw the first Chinese doing Rudyard Drift should have gone right away with it right I didn't I didn't I was stuck I was like complacent in that in, in that routine right so I, I I don't want my athletes to feel the same more I don't I want to do the same mistake as the athlete has in front of them okay this athlete is ready and then it becomes a strategy right is it worth it to mobilize this athlete right now with nationals mm-hmm. there? Uh, is it is it worth it to wait a little bit and, and then have them go to the next level after nationals here? Just right. becomes a, a game, right? But uh, it really depends. I, I do not have one strict rule on why I say, you guys are going to do this routine for the whole season or we're going to do three different routines the whole season. I have no it, – it's, it's an open mind about it. Yeah. I agree. I think it really depends on the level. I think that um, at least in like, I would say the middle elite, right? The youth elite, 13, 14, 15, 16. I think the most routines an athlete would compete in the season, it would be three, right? So they come in with their A routine, then they have a finals routine, right? And then yeah. they might have a really hard routine. And then if they, after they compete in the first competition and you know what, that finals routine was awesome. Let's, you know, let's focus on that. They move up to the finals team, the hard routine. And then I feel like having only three domestic competitions, right? So those three routines might be it for that year, right? And once you, like you said, once you get to the higher levels, that progress to the routines, you know, kind of, kind of slows down a little bit. I, I just right. think it's it, it's so different depending from athlete to athlete. Mm-hmm. It, it just, but but yeah, I agree with you. And then even with the senior levels, we did that last year, and then you saw Cody did the seventeen one routine at finals at nationals, for example, right? Because it was part, it was out of the selection procedures, did not count for qualification. So we wanted to play with 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 something that we want to compete internationally, right? So we did that seventeen one in the finals, and then use that 17-1, the same routine, to do on the qualifications at the World Cup in Valladolid and got his best result ever, right? But because mm-hmm. he was able to do it domestically, I think, and we were able to practice it in, in competition. So all that game is, is, is what makes athletes great and coaches great, yeah. I think. Yeah, I agree. All right, so let's start. Let's start with part one of these routines. So I have a document that I created a couple years ago, so it might be outdated. We have to we'll go over a little bit and check it out. Um, and then Nuno, you can give your two cents and what you agree, Absolutely. what you do differently. All right, let's check it out. All right, so here's the document. Um, there's a disclaimer at the at the top. Very important. Um, this is how I create routines. Um, and this is actually not always the way I, I make routines, right? I'm constantly, you know, evolving with the sport and, and trying to, uh, to change and, and mold and be ahead of the I curve. Think, I, I think that's the interesting thing is that, and I, and I also have a document with, with the routines where I, I can try and attach or, or, and put on the description below and we'll, when you guys can see all the, docu- all the routines. But the interesting thing is that these are dynamic documents. As we learn and we find an athlete that defies these documents, mm-hmm. then we're like, mm, maybe I can add this exception there and we can add this routine there and then this. And like, so they keep changing. <laughs> yes, that is, it's so true. Um, but please don't just copy and paste these routines, right? Um, the sport would be so boring if everyone did the same exact routine, right? It's more important yeah. as to kind of follow 
why we're putting in certain skills and when and why we're doing um, you know certain connections. So here's are some common rules. Obviously, it has some exceptions, but they're pretty good to 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 uh, live by. Right, number one, learn all singles before doubles. Learn all double bus, doubles before triples. Obviously, there's some exceptions, but it's a very majority. I would say 95% of the time, it's 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 true. Right, you don't want to be learning. Um, you don't want to be learning a double back before the athlete can do back tuck to back, right? That's even more than a single yeah. Um, yeah. or back tuck back, pike and back layout, right? Um, once it's applicable, train more than one routine, right? I, obviously, once, they're, once they're, they're younger and they don't have so many skills, they're only going to have one routine. But as soon as they get to the next step, he hold on to that easy routine and practice the next one. And, and, um, and it, it defies them mentally, you know, it makes them evolve to the next stage. And, and I can give you this example. We, we have this adult class and now they're interested in doing some competitions. Okay. So when I gave them the routine, it was hard for them to memorize the 10 skills because of, of how challenging it is to, mem to memorize 10 skills. First, it's easy because we live through the process, right? But for these kids, when they come the first time, memorizing a routine is the hardest thing. So if you start giving them right. one and then two and then three routines, they just they just evolve faster and they'll be better in school too. It's just, it's yes. just amazing how they, how they evolve, how they develop. All right, rule number three, always there's an asterisk there, compete the easiest routine. Um, and, and the emphasis here is on compete, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is, again, there's an asterisk there. So like, for example, if you're gonna take the first four, half out pike, back pike, half out tuck, double back tuck right so this athlete who might be new to doubles th they could probably get a little break here right do one double a single and then two doubles it might be easier than doing three doubles in the row at the beginning this is so imperative to do those three doubles at the beginning in training but if it's still new it might not be the best to to compete that right to compete. train it right get it ready but always compete the the routine that that the athlete um will do best, right? So, and I've seen this all the time, people throwing these like crazy routines where they do like six doubles or no, they'll do, this is what it was. This is what my train of thought. They'll do like two doubles at the beginning and then four at the end. And I'm like, well, that's <laughs> wonderful that you're trying to put more doubles into your routine, but you're not gonna score as high, right? And the whole purpose of trampoline is to score high in the competition. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where that came from. Uh, rule number four, keep big pieces and sequences from one to the next. Um, so for example, um, let's take that, that um, half out uh, uh, routine from before, right? You have a half out pike in the first and a half out tuck in the third. Right, so we're always going to have that first and third, and then we kind of play around with some other skills or that middle piece when they're younger. Right, we'll what swing time, right? Back tuck, brandy tuck, back pike, brandy pike, back straight, brandy straight. We'll see that in a lot of common routines. Right, it wouldn't make sense to do one routine back tuck, brandy tuck, back pike, brandy pike, back layout, brandy straight, and then the next routine, hey, we're going to do back tuck, back pike, back layout, three back skills in a row, and then three forward skills in a row. Right, so we always want to try to take a chunk from one routine to the next. Uh, number five check out um, more routine, more rules that pertain, pertains to the rules uh, or the doubles later on. So that's kind of the front skeleton um, and we'll get there probably on part two. And then um, build height or build routines, assuming the athlete is losing height. You hope they don't, right? But just assume <laughs> that, they, that they are, right? So for example, your first skill will be higher than your third, your third will be higher than your fifth, and so on. So you wouldn't, if your Trivis Pike is your hardest skill, you wouldn't put a fifth, right? You wouldn't start with a Rudy out and then put Trivis Pike fifth because you're, you're assuming to have less, less height. Um, Nuno, you had a great point um, earlier. Let's explain a little bit about how USA Gymnastics levels work. So give us a, just a brief overguide, and maybe you can compare it to, to what other countries have done. Well, we, we, we don't know all the countries, right? But, but let's explain USA Gymnastics. I think it's, it's just easier. People then can compare with their own country. So basically, USA Gymnastics is, is, is split into two programs, the, the Junior Olympics program, and that goes from level one to level 10, okay? And all from level one to level seven, they have compulsory routines. From level eight to level 10, they have requirements. So they can build their own routines as long as they have those required skills in the routine. And they have two routines. Easy. Uh, from 
and they have two routines after level eight, correct, sorry. And then after level 10, we have youth elite 11, 12, youth elite 13, 14, junior elite and senior elite right now. And open elite, sorry, I forgot the open elite. And um, so basically that's the elite program. And that's where, that's where we match exactly the requirements that FIG has for WAGs. So you, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 to 21, or 17 and over, they all have uh, uh, matching requirements to what we use at WAGs. So that, that's basically what, what's important for, for, for the audience to understand is that when we are applying this concept of the routines here, we're applying for the culture that we are involved in, right? So these routines all match the requirements that we have at level eight, level nine, level 10, and then, and so on. So this may not apply entirely to your country. You might have to make some changes on the requirements that are, that are, that are required by your, by your program. Simple as that. Right. All right, so these routines that we're gonna be starting with, our requirements for the level eight, the first level where they have an optional routine or second voluntary routine. Let's check it out. All right, so here's um, the first routine pretty much that we have. Um, they have eight, eight um, somersaulting skills, two non-somersaulting. Um, and TJ, so there's no, uh, I, did, I wrote TJ, SJ, and PJ for tuck jump, pike jump, and straddle jump. However, you could use the numerical code zero, zero in the position as well. Um, so here's kind of Nuno, you probably might have a little different than I, um, this routine, right. They connect two, two flips at a time. They either start with a so, front of the quarter Bernie ball out or back to quarter Cody, which now the requirements have changed. Um, but two year, a year or two years ago, right. Then they had the option. Um, actually in the second routine, they have the option. If I'm, I'm thinking about the first routine. So, Stephen, I'm sorry. Is sorry. this for is this for optional routine of level eight? Yes, correct. Okay, not for com not for the first routine. Okay, not for the first routine. And okay, this I is again, that, this might be a little bit routine. outdated. Um, as the this is la it might even be two years. I can't remember when, when this is updated. I believe I believe the first routine of level eight. The only requirement that we have is having a three quarters front Brandy ball out. I believe that's the only requirement we have for level eight, if I'm not mistaken. So for the first what routine. I the usually, routine. for the first routine, yeah. for what I usually do is I grab the level seven routine, which ends on three quarters front ball out, and I do a brandy ball out, brandy ball and out. that's the compulsory right. of the level eight. So it's an easy transition, as, as, you, as you all can see, you grab a routine that you're already doing, you switch the last skill from ball out to brandy ball out, and you have a compulsory for level eight. So easy for them to already memorize two routines, which are not very different, but they are different and they are, and they meet different requirements, right? So now for optional, I usually, I usually do you, where do you have the full, oh, you have the full at the end. Okay. I usually do it differently. Yep. So I, I usually do, um, and then again, I this have is, two this is a front components. Fall. This is a, yeah, this right oh, here. That Sorry, is a front I apologize. Fall. A front okay. fall. Yeah, yeah. I do not use, I do not use a front fall for, for, for level eight. If they cannot do a back fall, or at least the back pull, I, I don't let them go. I don't let them move to level eight. Yeah. That's just See, my principle. So that's just where, yeah, where we, where we differ, right? We'll teach the front full. First, at this mm -hmm. point, they'll be learning back half. Um, mm -hmm. And then they kind of learn Rudy and back full at the same time. Yeah. So we, I, I teach the, the Rudy and the back full at the same time. But uh, whatever they achieve first, as long as they have one or the other, I let them move to level eight. I have no problem mm -hmm. with that. But... They need to be able to do those skills. Front full, I don't, I don't let them do a front full. And what I usually do is, if let, let's let's assume they can do back full and Rudy, I do back straight, Brandy straight, full, straddle, Brandy tuck, back tuck, Brandy pike, back pike, straddle, Rudy. And people mm -hmm. always ask me, why do you use straddles instead of tuck jumps? And why do you have two straddles on the same routine? And the answer is very simple. First of all, because on optional, what happens if you repeat a skill? The, the difficulty of the second skill doesn't count. Straddle doesn't have any difficulty. So there's not right. a problem with that. And why do you use straddles? Well, I use straddles because I think it's the, it's the skill that takes the, le the least deduction. And I know here in this country, everyone, everyone uses a lot of tuck jumps. People love mm -hmm. tuck jumps here. But I just find the tuck jump, I don't know, I find the tuck jump a little bit childish. And at, at this level, I want them to move on. But don't get me wrong. I still have kids doing tuck jumps but I just prefer the straddle. I myself prefer the straddle. But if they're boys, 
the straddle is usually not their best skill. So sometimes they do for sure. <laughs> so again, for sure. Like, again, I play with those vertical skills to whatever mm -hmm. the other does the best. But if I could choose, it would be a straddle. Simple as that. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I mean, I don't. I wouldn't necessarily teach my kids to repeat skills only because just of the philosophy that you're not allowed to repeat them. But there's no deduction. There's no no foul, no harm. Right. Um, so this routine, right? So you can add the, the front of the quarter Bernie ball out. You could do the back of the quarter Cody. Um, and this is not a, a skill that they're necessarily going to be competing much, but I put it sometimes in the lower level routine, just so they get a lot of re repetition in of the back tuck to back pullover. I don't do it that often. Um, it's just something that's why it's in parentheses at the end. It's, it's, it's an option, all right, To do that back tuck to back nothing, pullover. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong in doing the three quarters back Cody there because for level nine they're going to need it. So if exactly. they have the ability to do it there, I don't see anything wrong with it. I just like I said, I have these routines that are preset for the levels because when you have eight kids and ten kids on the same level, it's just easier if they all do the same routine for your mental sake. Simple as that. So you remember what their routine is. So if you have these preset routines for each level, it's just easier for you to set your program. That's all. But I don't see a problem with that at all. Yeah. And and why and a lot I think I see a lot of people, you said you do straddle jump Rudy, right? We do straddle jump front full or Rudy. And mm -hmm. people are people are throw, doing the the back tuck Rudy and putting the pike jump like between back pike and Brenny Pike. Right. That's at that time. That's the most difficult skill this athlete knows how to do. Right. You want to have them set up, you know, with a nice, easy takeoff. They don't have to be throwing yeah. their back flip forward to backwards to get back to the middle. They can control that straddle jump nice and easy. And again, that's a little strategy tip. Right. Put mm -hmm. that straddle Absolutely. jump there. Right. This the tuck jumps and straddle jumps, even at this low level, you need to be strategic. Right. Why is that tuck jump there? probably because the Bernie Balt and the Cody are a little bit shaky still and they need a little break before they get into to some other skills. Yeah. On, on, my, uh, on my routine, I put the first straddle jump after the full, which is probably the skill that is the newest there, right? Mm -hmm. Or one of the newest skills. So to, for stability after the full, I get the straddle jump and then I have another straddle jump before the Rudy because it's, always, it's also the newest skill. They really need that stability for the connection there. Absolutely. I think that's something that's, that's been neglected. So let's, let's ch take a look at the next uh, routine. And I highlighted the combos kind of that. I forget which rule it was, which number, but right. Keep certain combinations, right? So keep the beginning, mm -hmm. the front of the quarter, bring the ball, the back to the quarter, Cody. Um, right. And then here we just have a, a larger connection of, of flips, right? Back tuck, Brandy so tuck, back pike, Brandy pike. Right. And here the, this is a, a, a same difficulty right or i'm sorry so no, this is still three this there's is still three level there's the pike jump there's three but this is still here, level eight, right, right correct okay this, this is or, just another this could, be, another this could be a level nine easy routine as well right if you use the the front of the, or the back to quarter cody right you have the, the rudy and you only have uh uh two non-somersaulting i'm sorry the last routine had three the tuck jump the pike jump and the straddle jump here we take out yeah. one of the the tuck jumps and the goal here right it, like we said, it's all about skill based, but here it's a lot about connection based, right? Before mm -hmm, we only mm -hmm. connected two flips at a time. Now we're connecting four flips at a time, right? The back tuck, yeah. Bernie tuck, back pike, Bernie pike. And then also the next step is the back layout Rudy. So I don't even know the difficulty of these two routines. It doesn't matter, right? The, the goal here is to start connecting more flips and connecting to the Rudy. Uh, is there anything you want to add on this, this routine before we uh, no. get to the next step? No, I, I, no. The, I, I think, I, like I said before, the routine that I do, the first level eight routine that I do already has uh, only two tuck jumps, only two vertical skills. So they already do the, that connection of the four skills in the middle middle there. I, I see no problem with having three. Really don't see. I just, mm -hmm. I, I, like I said, we, you build the routines for, for your program and then you just, you just get used to it. And then the athletes just adapt. <laughs> That's all. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So the next, right, the only the last flip that was single element that we're missing is that back full, right? And at this mm -hmm. point, just because it's not in the routine, the athlete should be mastering it. Um, the only problem is like, at least for me, the reason why the back full is not in there yet is the Rudy's at the end. So it can be shaky, right? If you're going to put Rudy and back full in, you're going to have to swing in and out of that back full. So it, you have to make sure that that back full is good enough to, to connect in and out of 
uh, even if it's just one flip, right? Um, that meaning you do like a back layout, back full straddle jump or a straddle jump back full, you know, it, you have at least one flip coming in and out. Um, so here, the so I have a question. Step, I have a yeah, question for you here. So is this still level eight or is this already level nine? For you? This would be level this. Well, now that it's changing, right? Years ago, this would be, this would be level nine. Not anymore. Level nine, Not anymore. they're doing, they're pretty much doing a double. This might be someone right. who like just moved to level nine, you know, and it's like after nationals and this might be the routine that they're practicing. So, for so the my question season. for you with this yeah. routine is why don't you have any vertical jumps here for this? Because you're not optimizing this routine to compete. Then. This could, right. for me, this could be a routine for training, you know, training for them to, to, to move on to the next level, to see if they have the, the, the skills that I want them, but I would never compete this routine. So it, 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 this depends on the athletes, uh, of course, readiness of course. for the double, right? So this would, this is an interim routine where the athlete can learn to do 10 flips, right? So they have that foundation. So when they, they're not learning to do 10 somersaults with a double in the routine, right? Mm -hmm. So they have that foundation. If the athletes, the athletes at this point should be learning a, a double pretty quickly. So that double should go in very soon. The, mm -hmm. um, if the athlete isn't ready for that double just yet, let's say they this had a really good growth spurt in the sport and it's December and it comes time for, for winter classic or, or something and, and that double's not ready, they might do this routine, but they evolve mm -hmm. very quickly to that double routine. So this routine has the back fold of Rudy and all the single uh, flipping elements um, at this point, right? Even the last routine, I think they should start, they should have already been starting their doubles um, behind the scenes, right? And this would be the last, the final routine without a double. Um, and again, that Rudy is probably the hardest skill. Rudy's tough, even for senior elites, man. Rudy's a tough skill. I would, I would keep that Rudy at the end for as long as he can. Rudy, Rudy is harder for <laughs> senior elite than for than for these guys. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, so at this point, right, they should be learning uh, double. I teach. Um, uh, double back and double double front or double front to flat back at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. The athletes will probably have the double back ready first before the half out. Mm -hmm. So that usually goes into mm -hmm. the routine first. Um, mm -hmm. However, there's always same exceptions. Like you said, depend on the size, right? Um, if, the athletes, like, the if, there's, if the athlete started late and they're 16 and fully grown, I'm gonna. I feel more comfortable spotting him on double back first before before the the, yeah, of the, the double front to flat back. Right, I it's think just a little a, bit less as a, risk. As a general rule of thumb, the double tuck is always easier to achieve, easier to spot, easier to do. But that doesn't mean that they cannot evolve fast fast for the half out as well. Mm -hmm. But the double tuck is probably easier. My my for, my next routine after this one always have the double tuck, not the half out. That's the... right. Yeah. So I think I think we're in the same boat. Um, yep. So before we before we move on. Um, the back fold is in the middle, the ruse at the end, this is a routine, but they should be learning. Like I said, they keep the same combinations, but don't train that, right? So make sure they're training all combinations. Make sure they're training, mm -hmm. you know, um, branny back full branny and back layout, back full back layout, right? Make sure they're doing back pike, Rudy back pike. They're starting to connect in and out of skills with different combinations, right? So yes, for the routine, keep the combinations for training, make them masters of all combinations. All right, so here's um, one of the first routines, and you can move around these positions, but essentially what it, the, the, the meat of it is, you got the double on, on the first skill, um, a straddle jump to, to give a little break, some flips, ending with the Rudy. Now, I know you like to put the, the double back <laughs> last skill, right? Yep. And why yeah. I put the double back first skill, right, is because when they learn the skill, they're learning it from a prep bounce, right? So it's just more comfortable from where they are. Also, you have more height on your first skill than your 10th skill. So yes. at this level, they might not be as strong. And it, it depends on how high they jump. It depends on their age, right? I, I don't, I, I, I see the importance of putting that double tuck um, last and it will go last in the next, not maybe the next routine or two routines after once they start adding another double. Um, but for me to, to learn that double back, um, after a brandy is, is tough, especially when those athletes, when they learn that, that first double, their brandies are crap, right? They're throwing them forwards. They're putting the brandy backwards. They're throwing their head on the double back because they're just like thinking about that double back during the brandy. Don't get me wrong. It's important to do, 
Um, but I, as far I just as, think as, as putting it into a routine first, I think it's the same way they've been practicing. And then off of the mat, they jump up, they do a big, tall, straight jump off of the mat, and then all they have to do is open, close their legs, right? So it's a lot more comfortable to learn at first. Uh, go ahead. So, I, so speak your I, mind on, on double back last skill. I, th I, I just think that uh, uh, in my experience, the landing of the double back uh, is harder than anything else. So it's much harder for them to connect the double back with anything else after the double back than before, from my experience. And I did not have any, any athlete that had a problem with putting the double back at the end of their skills uh, at this level. I really didn't. But you don't, when you teach double back, you teach from a prep bounce, right? You are correct. I do. I do teach, uh, yeah. teach from a prep bounce. And, and I see your point of view, but I just, this is, this is the routine that uh, I use to gain a lot more than what this routine gives me, I think, because this routine for me introduces the three quarters back, Cody, which you put before, but then you don't put here, which you will need for level 10 again. So you, you're, you're going level eight with three quarters back, Cody, you remove it for level nine, and then you have to bring it back again for level 10, which I introduce it here and it stays. And it stays almost throughout the rest of the life, and at least right now with compulsories and all that, stays there at, as, for, as first skill, right? And then I also introduce in this routine the full and the Rudy connected, which I think it's very important because they already did full and Rudy separate on the, on the previous one. So this would be the, the full and the Rudy connected and then the double tuck in the end. And I think as you're going to show, because I already saw your presentation before, as you're going to show, you're always going to uh, introduce the new skills or the harder skills at the end of the routine and then they go from the end to whatever position you want them on the routine but you don't do that on this routine here and i do i always go for the newest skill at the end of the routine when i say newest skill i say backward newest skill at the end of the backwards, routine yeah. and then and then bring it wherever i want on, on the routine and this one does not so what i do on mm -hmm. this routine is three quarters back cody tuck jump or straddle jump or whatever you want and then back tuck brandy tuck full rudy back pike brandy pike double tuck and yeah. then you can play with the with the backs I, and brandies that to start, pike start straight tuck pike straight whatever you want but a simple a simple routine and i'll i'll, I'll do the same the same routine right it's Later. just the, the, <laughs> this is an ex this is an exception right because the routine with the first double the athletes has it, it, it's a big it's a big giant step for them and if they have their hardest skill that they know and it's their first double only double that they know how to do last skill what do you think they're thinking about nine skills right yes but thinking, I, oh I my god think double, it's so oh my hard god, for them to oh connect god, double. I, I think it's so hard for them to connect after the double exactly because of what you're saying they say oh my god the double oh my god the double and then they don't yeah, No, it's the, the same correct. thing i say hey we're doing double back I'm going to spot you to the mat. Double back, I'm going to spot you to the mat. Okay, double back, you're going to the mat. I'll stand here. Double back, okay, jump off of the mat, open and close your legs. They do the same straight jump, and they don't even do like a straddle. They do like an open close. What, are, what do they call it? Like star position or whatever they star do. And then eventually it molds, yeah. and then it molds into, but, into a straddle jump. And this might not be a routine that competes. This is the routine, the first routine that, hey, you learned your double back. Let's put it into an optional routine. So they get some and, confidence and, with a double in a routine. And, and again, People don't have to agree on these routines. It, right. It's important, the final outcome. That's what I think it's important. There, there is nothing wrong in doing this routine. That's just not what I use. But it, I have nothing, nothing against it. I think people that need to understand that just because we don't agree on a routine doesn't mean that you or me are wrong. It means that mm -hmm. we have different paths to get to the same goal. Simple right. as that. And I think, I, I think it's just I, may, I maybe have some, some interim steps that, Aren't necessary. Yeah, maybe some people think necessary. Maybe not. Right. In my opinion, exactly. I do. You don't. Exactly. Right. So here I have that routine that you're thinking about just without the back pull. Right. So the starting with the back to quarter Cody or almost. the front of quarter Bernie ball outs. It's almost and the then, routine um, that I was thinking about. <laughs> and it depends. All right. And then uh, there. Well, there's no there's no positional jump here. No tuck jump or straddle jump. Yeah. Um, and the full and the rudy are not connected. The, right. Exactly. So that's what I said. Without the oh, I, you can put full in. So. Without the full, and, and for me, it's like the main goal, the, the purpose, right? We always have to look at a routine. What is the purpose, right? And here the purpose mm -hmm. is to yeah. learn the double back last skill. So the purpose is not to try to make the hardest connection, right? If you can have the same difficulty, if you can put the full and the Rudy and the double in a routine and, and, and not have problems, then let's do that. And then eventually the next step would be to connect to the back full of Rudy. Um, yeah, that, and, and, and again, I, I have no problem with that. I think it's important to mm -hmm. understand those things, that you can play with those connections and make it what you need out of them, right? I also had these routines 
just like that. And, and, and then I changed it because I saw that, that they can do both at the same time. Okay. But you might find an athlete that cannot do both at the same time. Simple as that. You know, they might, they have so much problem with the double that you might want to focus on the double. Then you separate the four and the woody. Totally fine. Totally fine. Not a problem at all. Yeah. So this next, this next routine is, is it, it's not a set routine. This really depends. Some of my athletes do this. Some don't do this routine at all. It's probably, I don't know what the percentage is, maybe 50, 50, 60, 40. Um, but it's an interim to the half out routine. So they learn to start with the front double. It's the one and three with the arms up to burn your ball out. Um, so they're learning to, to start with a front double first skill. If they're learning half out quickly, then we skip this routine and we just go right to the half out routine. If they're struggling with it a little bit, they'll spend a little, you know, a couple of weeks, a few months on this routine. Some people like to teach it. Some people don't. I mean, I think it's a necessary skill eventually that the athlete has to learn. They have to be able to do one and three with their arms down, arms up, right? So they have to be masters of all the aerial awareness. Um, for us at our gym, it's, it's pretty easy to teach because we have a spotting belt. We just, you know, you can teach front tuck to handstand, mm -hmm. stop, stop them in a handstand, and then they have to spot the bed. They have to heel drive because you stop to their flip. They have mm -hmm. to heel drive mm -hmm. to get over. So it's very easy for us to learn in the spotting belt. Um, if I didn't have the spotting belt, I don't know if I would teach this routine as often as I do. Um, well, I, I, don't, I don't teach this routine. I, I do agree that the one and three is very important, especially for the, for the future, I think so. But when I teach the first half out, I, do, I teach the flat back and I don't give much focus on, on the scene. Only, I only focus on the scene after they do half out so they don't get confused. I, I tried several ways and I have not had not even one athlete doing a brand knee in since I started coaching this way. And I'm going to stick with my way. People, I know it's like, well, but you're telling them not to see. I'm like, I'm telling them not to worry about seeing until they know how to do a half out. And then after they do the half out, then I go back. I teach the one and three opening with Brandy Ballot, which I think is very important. And I want them to see on all the half outs on all the, on all the turn. I do think yeah. it's very important to see. I just and don't I, think it's a very important step until they do the half out. Because Brandy's, because they want to see so much, they just let mm -hmm. go so early and they do the brand in super easy. So I, since I, I started I, doing it like this, I have zero problems. Now I know this is controversial. Don't get me wrong. I know this is probably the most controversial thing we have in, in our sport. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that the, the half, the turning early on the half out is so much of a case of a one and three double front or double front to flat back issue mm -hmm. as much as it is, a coach communicating with the athlete issue, right? Sometimes the athlete just is not ready to put that twist at the end, right? If you can tell that they're, they're, they haven't put enough repetitions in or they're not comfortable with their double or their timing's off, right? If they can't land perfectly on their flat back or if they're going in a, in a, in a spotting belt perfectly on their feet without over-rotating or under-rotating, then you know they don't have perfect control yet. It, it doesn't make sense to try to put that twist in, right? Or maybe they've yes, also but, skipped some some steps of the of I the think it's important. ball out or, or something. Yes, but I, th I think it's important to understand that at, at the, the rate that we're going nowadays, we're teaching half out to what, nine-year-old kids, 10-year-old kids. Right. Those kids don't think about saying, they don't, they don't even understand what they're doing in the air at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Later in time, they will understand what they're doing in the air. But at that point in time, they're not. At that point in time, I think and, uh, uh, audio cue is far more, far more significant than a visual cue at that point in time. Okay, I do and, agree that visual cues yeah. are everything in our sport. Okay, I don't want people to mis misunderstand that. But for this skill specifically, if there are even coaches that spot double fronts to feet for that reason because of people letting go so early. How many people have let go so early? It, it's a very it's a very dangerous skill in my opinion. So I prefer to be on the safe side and make sure that they don't care right. about that 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 thing until they finish the skill. And then whenever they do the skill, then yes. By all means, let's go back a little, give two steps back and do everything. But now they have the timing in their heads of how long they need to grab. So it's totally yeah. different. And I, I think, and one of the, I think uh, one of the reasons why I teach one and three, yes, is to spot, but that's not the, that's not the only reason. So, right. You teach, a, you teach by the quarters, right? One quarter for backdrop, right? Then two quarters, pull over mm -hmm. uh, to doggy or belly to back and then three quarters, right? So. I teach them so they, they know, okay, eight quarters, you hold on, right? One, seven quarters, right? You can open a little earlier. 
five quarters from touch to stomach, you open a little earlier, four quarters, right? So they're, they're mastering exactly where they are in space. They're not just flipping twice and then trying yeah, to find yeah, the absolutely. time. They know what one quarter, two quarters, three quarters feels like, five, six, seven, eight quarters, right? So they, they're, they're mastering um, when to open exactly when. So they know the exact timing, not guessing. So that's one of those absolutely. reasons uh, that they did that. Absolutely. Um, I just, so, I just yeah. think it's important the, the, the level of maturity. And just like you were saying before right. about school, why are we teaching school so early when they're not ready to understand? And I just think there are certain things that it's easier to let the body learn first and then the mind catch up later. And this is one of them. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to have to stop here. We're going to go into those half out routines and Rudy out routines on part two, maybe even part three, getting into senior elite routines. Mm -hmm. um, so and basically we'll give you a little quick little preview right from two doubles uh starting double back and we'll go into this starting with the, the double back or the half out next time that concludes our conversation on trampoline composition for today we hope you enjoyed learning how we build routines and our philosophies and we would love to keep the conversation going so is there something that we missed would you like to share your way with us let us know, comment below, email us at trampolineinsight at gmail.com. Reach out to us on Twitter at Tramp Insight, on Instagram at Trampoline Insight, uh, or you can send us a voice message uh, with your questions or opinions by following the link in the episode description. This was just part one. We're going to be hopefully doing part two in a, in a few episodes. We have some interesting and, and fun guests coming up. Uh, but we really look forward to continuing the conversation. So be a part of it, comment, send us messages. And until then, we'll see you next time, guys. And don't forget to subscribe and like so we know when new episodes are out. See you soon. Absolutely. Bye, guys.